Hi, my name's Phil Underwood. I'm a GP at the Lonsdale Surgery in Kirby Lonsdale. And as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, we're going to be rolling out the COVID vaccination really soon. When we've got it, we'll let you know, um, but we're not just quite there yet. Me and my colleagues are really excited about this and we're looking forward to being able to get to a position where we don't need all the restrictions that we're currently living with. However, I know some of you are kind of justifiably concerned about this vaccine. You feel like it's been brought out really quickly and you're worried that, is it safe? So I've had a look through all the data that's been produced so far and I'll tell you what I've found out and make, hopefully it will give you enough information that you can make an informed decision about it. What I'm going to talk about first of all is how the vaccines work and then I'm going to talk about um, what we know from the studies about how safe they are and how well they work and then I'm going to talk a bit about what we don't know yet as well and then finally I'll just wrap everything up and, uh, and that'll be it. To understand how the COVID vaccine works, we first need to understand a bit about how viruses in general work. Viruses are basically little packets of genetic material, usually RNA, which is what's inside the um, coronavirus. They get inside your cells and then that genetic material is released inside your cell and it uses the cell's own machinery to make more copies of itself. The way the COVID vaccines work is we just use a little bit of the genetic material from the virus. So we don't use all the other bits that it needs to be fully functional and reproduce and reproduce and cause problems. It's just the little bit that encodes for the spike on the outside of the virus. You'll have seen this spike before. So the virus looks like a football with lots of fuzzy pom-poms on the, the outside. These are the fuzzy pom-poms. The Pfizer vaccine uses a little kind of soapy bubble to hold the um, RNA for this spike protein, whereas the uh, Oxford vaccine uses a uh, deactivated virus shell to hold the genetic material. Both basically, like a virus, deliver that genetic material inside the cell, but they're not able to replicate, they're not able to multiply within your body. Once that genetic material is inside your cell, it starts making lots and lots of these spike proteins, and then that gets pushed out onto the surface of the cell where it's recognized by the immune system. And then the immune system gets an advanced warning of what it might encounter, and it gets ready. If you do get the coronavirus, this means that your immune system is ready and it's got the tools it needs to attack the virus and get rid of it before you even notice you've got it. And hopefully before you're able to pass it on to other people. So let's have a look at some of your concerns about these vaccines. One valid concern has been that you know, this has been developed really, really quickly. They say most vaccines take about 10 years to develop, whereas this one has been done in under a year. Well, Actually, with both of the Oxford and the Pfizer vaccines, these were being developed before the COVID pandemic started because they recognised that there's a potential for a pandemic of some sort to happen. We were given an advance warning with the Ebola infections in Africa and with the SARS epidemic in East Asia. So we thought, the scientists thought, how can we be ready for something like this? And that's where these vaccines are brilliant because it just relies on having this genetic code in a package that can be delivered. You can really easily change the genetic code. So as soon as we knew the, the genetic sequence of the coronavirus, they were able to put it in this package and start testing it. So they were able to get started really quickly. The other reason why it's gone so quickly is because a lot of the time spent developing a vaccine is actually not spent testing it, but actually waiting, waiting for funding, waiting to get volunteers enrolled. It's a bit like going for an airplane flight. If you go to Manchester airport, you have to go into security, you have to wait for security, you have to go to your boarding gate, you have to wait, and the whole thing takes two to three hours. If you fly by a private jet, you still have all the security checks, so you still have to show your passport, you still have to get your luggage scanned, the pilot still does his pre-flight check, but you don't have to wait in line. So the main advantage that the vaccine developers had was they had access to funds and it was just made easy. You've got a good promising vaccine candidate, here's some money, get going. They had access to volunteers as well. So 
normally you want to trial a new vaccine. It's kind of hard to get people to sign up for an experimental vaccine. When you told people that there was a potential COVID vaccine, they got more volunteers than they could really cope with. So that wasn't a problem. One final thing that got sped up was the process of getting ethics approval. Normally that takes eight to 12 weeks if you're lucky. Again, with this process, all the applications went to the top of the queue. Still went through the process, but it got expedited. So the next concern people have is, how do we know it's safe? Do we know it's safe? So, I mean, this is what all these recent trials have been about. And these have actually been a fair bit bigger than most other trials for vaccines. So I looked up a few recent vaccinations, the meningitis vaccine. That was done based on a trial of about 6,000 people. Both the Pfizer and the Oxford trials both had 40,000 people in their trials. In each trial, 20,000 people got the vaccine and 20,000 people got a placebo. And so what did we find? In both trials, we got similar results for both groups, uh, for both vaccines, in that many people who got the vaccine felt a bit off colour for a few days afterwards. Some people got a high temperature. A lot of people had some pain where the injection went in. And quite a few people just felt, you know, not right, headachey, just out of sorts, and then got better. So in terms of the serious adverse reactions, there was a small number of people in the vaccine group who got allergic type reactions. These weren't the dangerous anaphylactic type life-threatening um, life reactions, but they were rash, itching, wheezing. And so at the moment we're advising that people who've had severe allergic reactions do not have the virus. And that's basically, if you need to carry an EpiPen with you, we're probably going to ask you not to have the vaccination at this time. There were a couple of other things which were really rare, and we're not 100% sure whether these were caused by the vaccination or not. About four people in the vaccine group who got the Pfizer vaccine got a thing called Bell's palsy. And that's a condition where one side of the face gets paralyzed. Often the function returns. The problem is, is that we don't know whether that was just a coincidence because out of 10,000 people, you might well expect to get a few people getting a Bell's palsy during the time of the study. Um, so we don't know if that's a real uh, adverse reaction or not. Finally, in the Oxford vaccine, one person possibly got a thing called transverse myelitis, and that's a condition where the immune system attacks part of the spinal cord, and that can cause pain and weakness in one part of your body. We still don't know if that's a genuine reaction to the virus, uh, the vaccine, or not. One other question is, does the vaccine actually work? Yes, yes, they both work. Uh, the Pfizer one seems to work about 95%, so out of 100% people who would otherwise get infected, and by infected we're meaning a positive uh, COVID test alongside one of fever, persistent cough, shortness of breath, or uh, loss of sense or taste or smell, then about out of 100 people who would have got infected who have the vaccine, 95 don't get the, the infection five still get the infection so it's not a hundred percent protection against the vaccine uh, against the virus but most vaccines are not a hundred percent effective the other question people have asked is does it stop you transmitting it because we've heard a lot about people who don't have any symptoms at all but are still able to pass it on to other people and we don't know we just don't know we haven't been able to do look at enough people to be able to tell that. It would be a reasonable assumption to assume that if you've only got five out of 100 people getting symptoms, then a good proportion of those other people will not have enough of an infection to be contagious to other people. So it would be reasonable to assume that we can't transmit it to other people if you've had the vaccine, but we can't be 100% certain. Once we've got the vaccine rolled out and we see what the national numbers are doing, we'll have a better answer to that question. Finally, what are the things that we don't know about these, vac these vaccines? So the first thing that we don't know about is the really rare, the one in a million kind of adverse reactions. The, we, we did these experiments on two lots of 20,000 people who got the actual vaccination. 
and as far as we can tell there weren't any serious life-threatening things but if you did gave it to a million people we don't know from other vaccines we can make an estimate which would be that perhaps one person in a million would, would, million would get a thing called Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's a problem, again, where the nervous system attacks the spinal cord and it can cause really quite a nasty paralysis. Um, to compare against what else might give you Guillain-Barre syndrome, COVID can give you Guillain-Barre syndrome. And instead of one per million, it's about 500 per million people who get COVID will get Guillain-Barre syndrome. The other thing that we don't know about these vaccines is will they cause any problems further down the line in one, two, ten years time? And frankly, there's no way we can know the answer to that. We can look at other vaccines again, but we can't be 100% sure. But what, from looking at other vaccines, there doesn't seem to be any conditions that come on a long time after the vaccination. But we are looking for them. So there's an organisation called the Med Medicines and Healthcare Appliances Regulation Authority, the MHRA. They have a thing called the Yellow Card Scheme. That allows anyone, either a doctor or a member of the public, to report an adverse reaction to anything, any medication, but they've got a special web page set up purely for the COVID vaccinations. So if you think that you've had a problem with the vaccine, so not the sort of normal feeling a bit fluey afterwards, we know about that. But if you get a weird rash or if you suddenly start tingling all over or something weird happens or something unexpected and you think it might be down to the vaccine, notify them. We're, we're going to keep a record, we're going to look for patterns and just check to make sure to see if there are any problems. And you can do that online. The website is here. Okay. Finally, I've had a lot of patients asking me, are you, am I going to have the vaccine? Yes, absolutely yes, and I'll tell you why. So we've talked about all these rare but serious risks, so sort of one in a million, two in a million. The worst of these is possibly that Bell's palsy thing, that might be 400 in a million. Let's compare that against what's happened in this country since the start of this year. 1,000 per million people in this country have died from COVID this year. Approximately 5,000 per million have got long COVID, so a significant life-altering illness which doesn't seem to be getting any better for a proportion of those people. So you're comparing small numbers per million against huge numbers per million of being killed or seriously injured by this infection. It's, there's not a choice for me. I'm going to get the vaccination and I know all of my doctor colleagues at the practice are going to get it as well. Thank you for listening.